Excellency, Most Reverend Dr. Antony Sami Peter Abir, the Chairman of the CCBA Commission for Bible. Reverend Sister Simi Danya Kurian, FCC, the Lecturer of the Day. Mrs. Anjana Grace Biswas, who is going to lead us into prayer. My dear brothers and sisters, good evening to you all. I welcome you on behalf of the Chairman and the Member Bishops to the 15th lecture of our St. Paul online lecture series on the Gospel of Luke. May we begin with a prayer. May I request Mrs. Anjana Grace Biswas to initiate us into prayer. And today as she prays, let us also pray for her because she is celebrating her birthday today and she is thanking God for the gift of life. And Paul's College proudly thanks you and prays for you, sister, and our chairman also prays for you. Now may I request you to initiate us into the reading of the scripture and prayer. Thank you, Father Yeshu. I'll begin with the reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled amongst, among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us, I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. Word of the Lord. Let us pray. O Almighty God and most merciful Father, we thank you for bringing us together again today. We ask you to bless our Holy Father, Pope Francis, the bishops, the priests, and all the religious throughout the world, and those who have dedicated their lives to spread your word here on earth. Pour down your blessing upon the entire team of CCBI, especially our chairman, His Excellency, Most Reverend Peter Abir, and our principal, Father Yeshu. Today, we also remember all the families who have lost their near and dear ones during the past one and a half years. May the departed souls of their loved ones rest in peace. As we begin with our class today, we plead to Mary, our Blessed Mother, to intercede for us and send her spouse, the Holy Spirit, upon each one of us to guide and give us wisdom for a deeper understanding of the Word of God. Teach us the path of life and show us the way, Lord, so that we may share a more profound and intimate relationship with you. Open the eyes of our hearts and enlighten our minds, Lord, and help us to grasp the depth of your divine love. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings you have showered on us. We ask this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. Now I request His Excellency Dr. Anthony Sami Peter, the chairman, to introduce the speaker to us and to introduce the gospel of Luke. Father Yesu, our secretary, and all our participants, Father and fathers, brothers and sisters, and in special way, Sister Simi Danya Kurian, FCC. Uh, today's uh, speaker, I, on my part, welcome you all to this uh, online, St. Paul's Online Bible College series talk series and um, 
we know today father sister simi than danya kurian is a sister of the franciscan claris of our sisters uh, claris and she is from the francis province of jalandhar but he originates from my uh diocese in origin that means not to uh, palakkad but from kerala kerala so i am very happy to welcome her and also she yes uh, she is very much qualified to give our talk today she did yes uh, her uh, uh, ug in mahatma gandhi university in kerala itself and uh, continued her masters degree master master of theology in jdv pune jdv pune and now she is pursuing a doctorate i mean phd in innsbruck university on st luke st luke's gospel so it is a very worthy person very fitting person to give us uh, even though she uh, does her work on look god no her studies on st john she is doing no she is doing st john sister yes 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 sir yes st john but but she is uh, yes very much qualified on st luke also to give us her talk today and i welcome on the part of everyone of our, our participants uh, welcome sister and uh, i i i appreciate you on behalf of our secretary so also because you accepted to give your talk from innsbruck austria you know luke's gospel is the gospel of human beings we can say gospel of uh, the poor gospel of the woman gospel of the sick gospel of the downtrodden a uh, prayer holy spirit so many things we can talk about gospel of saint luke and uh, luke himself as uh, the sister read in the beginning she went through all the writings of uh, about jesus christ being a disciple of saint paul luke and she he very clearly wrote pictures he gives a very good picture of saint G- uh, of jesus as a divine mercy savior so that is the what i remember because i i have done lot of studies also on luke and so i am very happy that uh, this uh, lecture is held on saint luke and very very uh, systematically luke has presented the jesus uh, i say jesus of not only jesus of nazareth but jesus of faith uh, christ of faith so uh, with this introduction i will uh, like to ask our sister simi to begin her lecture uh, that will be very very enlightening to all our participants thank you very much thank you thank you your excellency for your words of appreciation to sister simidanya the speaker of the day and for encouraging our students and thank you for introducing us to the gospel of luke its nuances and its various dimensions now dear sisters and brothers let us now listen to sister dan simidanya who is now lecturing from innsbruck last month we had a lecture from rome and this month we have from innsbruck so already we are going international with the different time zones and our students are also attending from different time zones from malaysia and i am happy that our chairman's dream is coming true that our college is going international and now sister dimya the danya practical information now it's 4:11 so you may go up to 4:55 and we'll have 10 minutes break maybe you can take a break of 10 minutes and come i'll engage the student then from 5 5 will again continue till 5 50 and at the end you will conclude with a prayer at 5
Thank you, Sister Nidhanya. Well, now I'll turn on the presentation also. So now, up to, now please go ahead. Thank you. Shall I begin now? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, good evening to all. First of all, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank His Excellency Most Reverend Dr. Anthony Sami Peter Abil, the Chairman of the CBCI Commission for Bible, for introducing me and for the words of introduction and welcome. Thank you for your visit from me. And also, I thank Father Yeshu Kedinanidhi for inviting me or extending such an opportunity to me, Father Yeshu whom I met in 2016 as my professor in JDV, in whom I see an ideal and excellent teacher, not only excellent, very generous and encouraging teacher for the students like me and many others. Thank you, dear Father Eshu. And also, I would like to thank Ms. Anjana Grace Bishwas for leading us into prayer, and I wish you a very happy birthday and God's abundant blessings upon you, Mom. And now, I welcome you all, dear friends, to today's presentation, today's discussion, as we are going to have, I hope, a fruitful session together, looking at Jesus through the eyes of Luke. And I think the introduction part is already clear from the prayer and the reading from Ms. Anjana and the introduction of our dear Bishop Samji. Very clearly, both of them narrated what exactly the Gospel of Luke is. And dear friends, we know we have only one Gospel, that is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, but presented or written before us in different forms. And we have four of them in the canon of our Bible. Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, together we call synoptics, and then Gospel of John. And today we are going to see the Gospel of Luke as we have already heard from the introduction of our Bishop G. And in the process, we know Gospel of Luke. What are we going to see? The procedure is already given in your notes as well as here. We shall see or we shall have a basic introduction, structure of the gospel, and infancy narrative in detail. What is infancy narrative? That is, in a way, the, a unique figure, way of presentation of the entire gospel message in detail. Then we shall have the themes, important themes of the gospel, and the most important part of gospel of Luke, the concept of Jesus Christ according to Luke. And then finally, we shall have theological and inspirational messages of the book. As I begin, first as a part of basic introduction, as our Bishop Samji said, we shall we know Luke is a gospel which is very close to our human life and nature. Why it is so close to our life, so realistic experiences of Jesus' life is explained in the Gospel of Luke in a very interesting and human way. And we know in Luke's Gospel, all the category of people, whether sinner or saint, or men or women, or a friend or enemy, or the least and the last, all are treated equally with special dignity and consideration. And why it is the gospel according to Luke? The first place, who is the author? It is considered or accepted as Luke, the physician and traveling companion of Paul, is the author of the third gospel, that the gospel of Luke. Prem, where do we find the explanation or details of Luke? When we look at internal evidences in the New Testament itself, in Colossians chapter 4, 
And second Timothy chapter four, a letter to the Philemon. We have notes about Luke, the traveling companion of Paul. And it is accepted that Luke has written this gospel. Luke has written two accounts. One is gospel of Luke. And second is Acts of the Apostles. When we compare, when we, we see or we find where gospel ends, begins the Acts of the Apostles. At the end of the gospel, Jesus says or instructs to the disciples, remain in Jerusalem. So they worship Jesus and return to Jerusalem. And see in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, again, the same instruction, wait, not to leave Jerusalem. And at the beginning of the gospel and Acts of the Apostles, we know the theme to whom the gospel or this writing is addressed to, Theophilus. So from all these internal evidences, it is accepted that Luke is the author. And if you look for the external evidences, we have the second century theologian and bishop, St. Irenaeus. And from 3rd century, the Tulin and Origin, the church fathers. And in, from 4th century, the church historian Eusebius. All these people have mentioned about Luke and his gospel. So it is accepted that Luke is the author of this third gospel. Um, which is the place of composition? Antioch in Syria. Why? The reason is simple. Luke was a native of Antioch in Syria. So it is considered that it is written there in Antioch in Syria. And what is the time period or time span in which this gospel is written? It is considered that from 80, 80 to 90, we know one book, such a narrative cannot be written overnight or with one week. So it's the lifespan of 80 to 90. And the first gospel mark is accepted that or considered to be written between 65 to 70. So this gospel, not before that and not later than AD 90. So this time span of time of composition is considered as 80 to 90 AD. And what are the dif distinctive features of the gospel? Just I caught from Sidlow Baxter, it's very clear what is the emphasis. He says, the emphasis lies on in Matthew, on what Jesus said in Mark, what Jesus did. And look, it's not what Jesus said, it's not what Jesus did, but on Jesus himself. So the distinctive feature, the speciality of the nature is very clear from this. It's not that it's only about Jesus. Yes, of course, it is what Jesus said, was what Jesus did, but the emphasis lies on what Jesus, Jesus himself. Then, in details or precisely what, where the emphasis lies on, look and emphasis lies on, especially God, salvation, salvation in time of redemption, and Holy Spirit, glory of God, and look very much stresses on prayer, divine plan that is fulfilled in Jesus. And believing how radical is discipleship and very precisely forgiveness of sinners and the word of God. And we heard already, Jesus' universal concern is very much stressed in the gospel. Universal concern in the sense we understand. It is very significant for Gentiles, poor, women, marginalized, sinners, etc., so it has a universal character. And Luke relates events in Jesus' life to secular history. That's the reason Luke is known as historian evangelist. When we read very clearly, we understand this year of, or when this person is the king of Jerusalem or king Roman emperor. So very clearly, when at the time of Augustus, when that order is proclaimed, so very clearly historical facts and Jesus' life events are connected. And Luke is the longest book in the New Testament, has almost 1,121 verses. So it's considered as the longest 
book in the New Testament. From there, we shall see what are the literary characteristics, the Gospel of Luke, what are the literary characteristics. Luke had training in Greek composition and medicine, both. That's the reason we find many terms which are medical as well as theological, medical terms and theological terms. And he had a talent for writing. And Luke knew the Hebrew Old Testament well. This is also very clear when we go through the pages of the gospel. When Jesus narrates something, when he speaks something, it has automatically, this reading or incident takes us back to something in Old Testament. It has a very good allusion to the Old Testament that shows his knowledge about Hebrew Old Testament. And he uses vocabularies which are missing in other gospels. And he was very much skillful to use chiasms as major structural device. What is chiasms? I just tell you in simple way. Chiasms is the repetition of a particular verse or a particular theme, or it can be a word. It's repeated in a sweeten. And when it is repeated, the same idea is repeated, but it is further developed or something is added. So this is very common when we learn poetry, of course, in prose also. So this is like a repetition of themes or ideas in a particular way that is chiasm. And Luke is very much expert in using these chiasms. And he repeats similar stories with variations. I just tell you one example to make it clear. When we read chapter 1 verse 8, we read something, the child grew in wisdom or grew and became strong in spirit. About whom? About John the baptizer. John the Baptist. You just go to chapter 2 verse 40 and 252, we see almost the same thing with slight differences about Jesus. So it's his method of explaining something and repeat the same thing with slight variations. The same way he used particular terms frequently and these terms then later never appear in the gospel. And we know in the first verse itself, Luke says um, he's writing an orderly account. So he organizes the genre of his work as a narrative, an orderly account. And his, his historical narrative, I have already told, he connects life events of Jesus with secular history. So it's a historical explanation. And what are the salient features of the gospel? We can find or we can see many things, but we can categorize them in three headings. First, dom domesticity in the gospel. Second, dramatic quality of the gospel. And third, Jerusalem at the center. From the, this heading itself, it is clear what it is. What is domesticity in the gospel? Many of the incidents or majority of the incidents in Luke's gospel are explained or occur in private houses. And there are frequent references to feast, eating, and drinking. We know Jesus goes to the house of Simon the Pharisee. He visits the house of Zacchaeus. And we have a visitor knocking at the door at night. We have a woman in gospel baking at ho home. And we have another woman who is sweeping the house, lighting the candle, and searching for the lost coin. And we remember, and we can never forget the father who is waiting for his son at her house. So all these things happening and the house at Bethany, all these things occur or happening in family background or at particular house situation. So it's family atmosphere is kept in Luke's gospel. And second, it is dramatic quality of the gospel. When we think about a drama or a film, what is first thing? 
Now this drama, when we read or when we watch a drama or a film, what happens? A lot of emotions that come forward in our own life or our own heart and mind. Look at any of the incident narrated in Luke's gospel. We see a lot of emotions here. Just one or two I have shown here. Just Jesus raising the son of widow of nine. Just a moment. Think about the situation. A widow, a cursed person, despised person in the society. Already seeing a widow itself. A widow's presence is not a recommended one. So such a person, her only, only hope is the son who is now died. She is crying. There are people compassionate with her, crying with her. There are people criticizing her or uh, looking at her with a lot of contempt because again, she is a curse. And in such a situation, Jesus comes forward, a person full of compassion. He brings the boy back to life. And the mother, you can just imagine, cannot even speak because of excitement, extreme joy. And there are people who wonder at what happened there. There are people who criticize Jesus. And there are people who saw God's hand in that and thanking God. So we know a mixture of cluster of events appear there in this single incident. This is same if we take any of the narrations or the incidents presented in just Luke's gospel. So it's a lot of dramatic quality in his narration. And in second place, why it is dramatic? Luke has a special ability to present two contrasting things side by side. By doing so, one makes or illumine the other. Simple example, gospel opens with an unwilling priest in Zechariah and second incident, an willing maiden in Mary. Two sisters, one practical, one is very mystical. Over two sons, one is law-breaking son, whereas the other law-abiding son. Ungrateful Jewish lepers one side and grateful Samaritan leper on the other side. A self-righteous Pharisee one side, self-abasing tax collector on the other side. It, the list goes on. So it's his special ability to present things side by side, contrasting things. And the third equally important that makes gospel look as women, gospel of women. Equality of men and women. Uh, this is not so new thing today, but you can we can just imagine 2000 years before where women were not even considered as human identity. She was considered with slaves, children and women together. In such a society, Luke presents women along with men. Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, Simeon, and Anna, the widow of Sarefat, Naman the Syrian, the centurion, other side the widow who proclaims faith, Simon the Pharisee, one side, other side the woman Sinna who found Jesus, and men disciples and women disciples are mentioned in Luke's gospel, both named, and there are people not named women disciples. And good Samaritan in one side, Martha and Mary, other side. Examples of neighborly love and God's love. And God is presented as a searching shepherd. And God is presented in a searching woman. And to teach the importance of perseverance in prayer, Luke presents two stories. One is a man seeking for bread. Other side, a woman seeking for justice. Both of them, men and women. Come to Passion and Resurrection narrations. Simon of Cyrene, one side. The women of Jerusalem, other side. And Joseph of Arimathea, the women from Galilee with the spices to anoint the body of Jesus. So we have parallels in, from men and women in gospel. And the third important Speciality is Luke kept Jerusalem as the center of everything. 
Jerusalem plays an important role in the Gospel of Luke. Jerusalem is the place where the mystery of Christian faith has to be realized. The Gospel begins in Jerusalem and ends there. And Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem. And we know the most important instructions, teaching and incidents are explained during, within chapter 9 to 19, which is known as the travel narrative. Whereas Mark and Matthew with one and two chapters completed this journey, Luke presents the nine, ten chapters for this and presenting as Jesus traveling towards Jerusalem. After resurrection, Jesus instructs the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. We go to Mark and Matthew, what we see, disciples are to go to Galilee. So Luke has a specific place for Jerusalem in his gospel. And again, some more special attachments, something specialities, specificities if you take, parables. But we see parables in other gospels too. But Luke has certain parables which we cannot find out in other Gospels and very much related to our life, simple, realistic life situations. And here comes the question, what is a parable? A simple way to understand, parable can be explained as a story, explained at the end with a moral lesson. And the same parable or parabole in Greek means illustration, comparison, a figure, type, or a proverb, etc. So it's simply, we can, we will never forget when we think a story at the end with a moral, that is a parable. And we see in Go Luke, many parables, which is, which are very unique. What is the importance of presenting things in this way, in parabolic way? Because we can convey complicated truths in such a way that can be related and understood in, in one's own, to one's own life. And very special, Luke's parables are realistic stories, rich in homely details and characterization. Already we have seen, they are not so much allegorical, but realistic stories. And in second place, another important feature of Luke and Gospel is the concept of peace. Luke considers peace at the center of the Gospel of Luke. He believes or he presents as Jesus and his Gospel brings peace to the world. The term used for peace in Greek is eirene. It has a parallel in Hebrew, shalom. It means, it doesn't mean absence of war, absence of fight. But it means wholeness, well-being, state of well-being, prosperity, completeness. So the special meaning of peace in Luke's gospel is redemption from oppression. Light to the Gentiles, you know, Gentiles and the out Samaritans, all these groups who are outcasts. So for them, light, for them, a message of peace and forgiveness of sin blessings to the outcasts and especially like Mary, yes to God and to those of goodwill and joy in the reign of God and in the community of God. So Luke gives a new meaning to peace, that peace remains or seems to be at the heart of Luke's gospel. And thirdly, mission is another important theme in the gospel of Luke. We have two sets of call narratives in Luke. One is the call of the twelve, and second, the call in general. Whether it is uh, the call of twelve or call in general, general, what is important? The call or following of Jesus is unconditional, an unconditional following of Jesus. And Luke present this mission or the call narrative with the same characteristics. Whether the call is individual call, whether it is call of a community or the general call, the call have the same mission, same characteristics. Take or carry nothing. And power to cure and heal. 
and what is to be praised, the kingdom of God has come. And once you enter a village or a town, stay in the house. When you are not welcome, leave the place. And they went and they returned. They departed and they returned. And what does it mean? Every Christian, whether I'm a religious, I'm a specially called, or I'm a gen person of general vocation, every Christian has to be a missionary. And the mission and mission formula remains the same for all. And Luke has a specific meaning for the use of the tense today and now. The tense today in Greek, semeron, and now noon. This is these two words occur frequently in the gospel of luke and eschaton is the last day what is this eschaton or last day the time of salvation why luke uses this today and now so often the reason for luke salvation has already begun in jesus or in presence of jesus the eschaton or the last day or the time of salvation has become today. It's not the last day, but today itself, because Jesus, this salvation has already begun in Jesus. Here the emphasis lies on the moral conduct and way of life now and every day. We cannot wait for another day because it happens today, now and every day, not for once and for all, every day. That's why these two terms are very important in Luke's narrative today and now. So, just in a moment, what we have seen so far, first order, place, and day. Luke wrote in Antiochian Syria and between 80 to 90 AD. And it has a specificity. Matthew emphasized on what Jesus said. Mark on what Jesus did, Luke emphasizes on Jesus himself. And the salient features, the gospel is filled with domesticity, dramatic quality. You remember what were the emotions and con presenting events in contrasting way and equality of men and women. And Luke places Jerusalem at the center of the gospel. And he has a specific way of expressing things through parables. And his concept and peace is very central to the host gospel. And the mission is same with the same characteristic for everyone. And he precisely, he mentioned today and now the salvation has begun in Jesus Christ. So this is what we have seen with this 10 to 15 minutes. The basic introduction about what is the gospel of Luke, what is the specialities, and all. I hope so far it's okay. Then we proceed. Next is the structure of the gospel. We know in different way we can divide it, but commonly accepted by majority of the scholars, the gospel, the first prologue of chapter one, verse one to four. Then comes infancy narrative, chapter 1 and 2. And 3, preparation for the public ministry, chapter 3, verses 1 to chapter 4, verse 13. And begins at 414, the ministry in Galilee, and ends at 950. And the journey begins at 951. And the it goes up to chapter 19, verse 28. This particular part I have already mentioned, known as travel narrative. And then comes ministry and the last days of Jesus in Jerusalem, resurrection and post-resurrection appearances in chapter 24. These are the common, this structure accepted by different scholars. So we come to the infancy narrative in detail. 
Why infancy narrative is so important to Luke's gospel? As I told you, it's a miniature gospel. Every theme that is so dominant in the entire gospel is summarized here. And when we think about the infancy narrative, first thing that we keep in mind, we must remember is when the church started preaching, church did not speak anything about the birth and childhood of Jesus. What was the concern of the first preaching or the first kerygma of the church? Just recall the preaching of Peter after Pentecost. They were not talking about yeah, Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, no. What they were talking about, Jesus, the risen one, whom the people of the rulers, of the leaders of the, the Jewish society has sent, handed over to crucifixion. So the first kerygma was risen Christ and cross and passion. Then the question comes, from where did this man come? Why he, is, he was sentenced to death? So the explanation goes by life, ministry, and what he did. Then automatically, naturally, the question comes, from where did this man appear suddenly, one day, a grown-up man? So the story goes by where Jesus was born, an infancy of history of Jesus. So it was not the first charisma of the church. And in explaining the gospel in the writing, only Luke and Matthew included this infancy narrative, not Mark and John. And this Matthew and Luke, both of them have genealogy. Genealogy means list of ancestors. Why emphasis this point? Because Matthew have genealogy going back to Abraham. Matthew, a Jew, wrote to Jew present the gospel of Jesus Christ as a Jewish messiah. So he go back, goes back to the origin of Jewish religion. Whereas Luke goes back till Adam. We know who is this Adam. Adam is the first man, the father of the entire human being. So Luke presents Jesus as the son of God as well as son of Adam. The universal character of his gospel is evident right in the genealogy itself. And again, when we compare the genealogy of Matthew and Luke, Joseph dominates in Matthew's infancy narrative, the dream. Joseph had the dream. But Luke's gospel, Mary is the recipient of the message. An announcement and birth of John is parallel to that of Jesus that is shown in Gospel of Luke. And we don't find an evil Herod in the background. We see that Herod in Matthew's Gospel in the beginning itself. But we don't find that one evil Herod in background. Only shepherds and pious Jews, Simeon and Anna are presented. Means no evil figures are appearing. And Luke chapter 1 introduces John the Baptist and Jesus to the reader. Luke chapter 2 focuses attention on the person and mission of Jesus. So this is the importance of this particular infancy narrative of Luke. From there we come to the literary form of infancy narrative chapter 1 and 2. Three specific literary forms are used in this infancy narrative. First, Midrash, second, Apocalyptic, third, History. So here comes the question, what is this Midrash? We study that Luke employs Christian Midrash. What is this Midrash? Simple to understand. And I'll just tell you an example. When we read in the first part of the infancy narrative, we come across Zechariah and Elizabeth. We read so, they were advanced in age, they led a blameless life. Whom do we recall there? Automatically, if we know the book of Genesis, our memories goes back to Abraham and Sarah. Both were advanced in age, barren, no child, and righteous people. So this is exactly, it's Midrash word has the meaning, simple meaning to seek, inquire, investigate, in rabbinic studies, it is the form of uh, exegesis. 
but we can understand this as midrash the citation of an explicit or use of an explicit citation of or an allusion to a passage in an authentic text the purpose is to provide a foundation for religious teaching so when luke presents something here that particular incident has some kind of allusion to the events in old testament so that becomes authentic another example when we hear the magnificat of mary mary sing my soul magnifies the lord and thank in god what do we remember hannah's prayer in first samuel where with the same words hannah praises god so this is a way of allusion to something in another authentic text so luke uses this method enough when we come across the bible we will see that so many places without explaining we remember something behind an apocalyptic without explaining you know what is apocalyptic it is a literary form conveys the message through visions and revelations using colorful imagery and mysterious symbols simple example the last book of the new testament book of revelation the best example for apocalyptic literature a lot of vision symbols imagery at first hands when we read we don't even understand what is this symbol and everything it is apocalyptic you remember the gospel of luke had also used or infancy narrating especially used this visions dreams symbols signs etc so it's apocalyptic and the third one history i think i no need to explain again how many times explain that luke relates incidents in jesus life with secular history so the third form is history used in that and what is the first incident narrated in the infancy narrative annunciation to zachariah we no need to read now because of the time concern but you all we all are familiar with this incident annunciation of the birth of john is a preparation for the birth of jesus it's presented as a preparation for the birth of jesus and who was zachariah zachariah was priest of the division of abija what is this division the entire priest category was divided into 24 groups or divisions and each group has two weeks time to serve in the temple it was during his temple service zachariah received the vision and it is mentioned elizabeth he, she was of the tribe of aaron aaron was a priestly class that shows that not only zachariah elizabeth was also or elizabeth also shared the priestly ancestry of zachariah and they were qualified as righteous before god led a blameless life and she and has been were advanced in years we are going back to abraham and sarah and we know what happened in their everything and the second incident is the annunciation to mary the incident as such we are not explaining because we think that we have read the gospel we know what is happening in the annunciation so what is significance of this event that's all what we explain here annunciation is centered on the conception of jesus as the messiah and god's son if you remember every word the angel says it's very clear the power of the holy spirit will come upon come upon you and you will conceive a son you will be called son of god so the the intention is of the presentation is to present jesus as the messiah and son of god and the salvation that he would achieve for those who depend on god and mary heard the word of god and obeyed it of course she had a doubt and she asked and mary had given or mary was given a sign what was the sign that sign was the conception of elizabeth who was barren who was advanced in age and mary was named as the favored one or the highly favored normally we pray hail mary full of grace 
but exactly what the wording of the angel from the ordinary Greek language, highly fervored one. And we see the words, the verb come upon and odd overshadow. These are parallel expressions refer to God's intervention in human affairs. And when, as I said, when we hear this word overshadow, we remember something else. Overshadow is a word very dominant in the book of Exodus chapter 40. The cloud that covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. See the word used there also overshadow because this power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God is just taken, taking us back to the incident of exodus and it has an illusion or the meaning that it is purely god's effort god's work not of anything of human it's giving some it resembles as i have mentioned in the beginning itself hannah's prayer of thanksgiving in first samuel not only to hannah's prayer it alludes to at least 12 other old testament passages which were sung by the people thanking god who saved them at different occasions we will come across this different uh, whole testament allusions when we go ahead and mary viewed herself as occupying an important role in the history of salvation and this magnificent we know we can divide as into four strophes means we can just simply say for paragraph or for groups something the first strophe that is verses 46 and 48 we know that as my soul magnifies the lord from there mary begins so mary praises god for what god has done for her so this is important mary praises god for all that he has done for her and mary's hope of salvation rested in god and god's promises it's not her power or ability but it is God's promise and his mercy the salvation is. And she refers herself as Lord's servant. That is Mary's attitude, we know. Mary considers herself as Lord's servant. And the second strophe, that is Mary glorifies God for his power, holiness and mercy. We remember that only one, one sentence, we understand all these three attitudes comes there the mighty has done great things for me power and holy is his name holiness and his mercy is for those who fear him he prays god for his mercy and then verse 51 and 53 that's the third strophe reflects on god's power in reversing certain social conditions he has shown strength with his arm he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts he brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly so it is something the beggar became the king and king became the beggar the same way the upset down everything changed and the last trophy recalls god's mercy to israel and to mary it's not only to israel and to mary that means God's promise and God's mercy is to all. And this particular Magnificat in its theology or its understanding, we can consider as a revolutionary document. Why? It's a simple hymn of thanksgiving, contains three types of, three levels of revolution. Today we know the word revolution very well, but in that time. See the first, he has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in thoughts of their hearts. Moral revolution. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. A social revolution. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Economic revolution. So it's a revolutionary document. Why Luke has kept this song and the lips of Mary? By doing so, he exemplifies the essential task of discipleship and emphasizes the sharing of the word of God. So Magnificat is very important in its meaning, its understanding and concept.
where God's promises are fulfilled in the lowly and ordinary people. And the next is Benedictus. Again, it's a familiar hymn. We know the when we pray the morning prayer and evening prayer, this magnificat and benedictus come very often. Every day, not often, every day. So what is the dominant themes in this? God's benevolent intervention. How God intervened in the history of Israel, history of humankind, the salvation of the people. How every time he brought salvation through different people, different things, and finally, the salvation in Jesus and the power of the word of God. And the salvific plan, planned in the time of Abraham and David, reaches its fulfillment in Jesus. And Zechariah, what he does here, he extols God for his messianic deliverance and rejoices in its result. And he expresses absolute certainty concerning no doubt at all in the fulfillment of salvation in Jesus. And it is very typical, not only to this Benedictus, typical to Luke's gospel, salvation through the forgiveness of sins. So what is salvation for Luke? It is a result of God's loving kindness and mercy. This is what we sing in Benedictus. Salvation through the loving kindness of mercy. And the next event narrated is birth of Jesus. And we know what happened, how it occurs, occurs, all these things. So only we are going to the theological aspects of this incident. Luke's account of Jesus' birth emphasizes the political situation to explain why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus or Jesus' parents, they were not of in Bible or gospel begins, they are not the people of uh, Bethlehem. Then why did they go to Bethlehem? So Luke explains the historical fact. It was the time Emperor Augustus ordered something and to fulfill that, Joseph went to his native place, but not place, that tribe, Bethlehem place, city of Bethlehem with his wife Mary. So the reason why Jesus is born in Bethlehem. So he sets birth of Jesus in the context of world history. And Luke connects Bethlehem with David. Why? Jews were waiting for a message, Jewish Messiah from David's tribe. So here he connects this Bethlehem with David that brings Jesus also son of David, the royal Messiah. And he presents Jesus' humble beginning. He had no place in him. He was not a person. Otherwise, he was not a person in the, in the safety of an inn to born. He's an ordinary, simple, poor man, uh, identified with the poor people. That's what Jesus' humble beginning. And Luke introduces Jesus' identification with the poor and his consequent rejection in his birth incident. The firstborn. This thing's very clear for us. Firstborn is to be offered in the temple according to Jewish custom and should be redeemed with an offering. And we know Mary and Joseph, what offering they have taken? They have taken the offering of the poor, not the rich people. And the firstborn, when it is offered in the temple and redeemed with an offering, he receives the birthright too, the, as the elder child of a Jewish family. And what is very significant, another theme in this birth narrative is manger. In a simple narrative or simple paragraph, three times this theme occur, occurs. Verse 7, 12, and 16 to 7. It is a sign of poverty or sign of rejection. Or we can say it's a sign of poverty and rejection. rejection. Shepherds, who were shepherds? Shepherds were not so recommended people in then society. They were considered sinners. These shepherds were the people who received first the announcement of Jesus' birth, the message of good news and joy. The message today, we have seen the importance today. Son of God, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord is born. This particular message has an allusion to the prophet Micah. In chapter 2, where he prophesied this thing. 
And as I have mentioned earlier today, the eschatological realization of redemption or salvation, the salvation happens here in the person of Jesus that happens today. And second mention of this manger is 212. It's, it has a sign value. Why, what the shepherds have seen? The shepherds have seen or they found a savior in the manger. The child in the manger becomes a sign. Sign is something that points to something. So here the child in the manger points to the person of the Messiah and his role in God's saving intervention. Thirdly, 2.16, God's new disposition toward the people. Why it is God's new disposition? Isaiah chapter 1.3, Isaiah complains, yeah, or or presence, Yahweh regrets that his people do not understand him. Even the ass and ox know or take, come to know this Yahweh, but my people do not understand me. And Jeremiah 14, 8, Jeremiah complains that God has forgotten his people. He's not visiting his people. And who is in the manger? Jesus, the son of God. Here the God did not forget God has visited his people in the form of his son, Jesus, the child in manger. And wisdom 7, 4 and 5. There is a mention about child Solomon. Solomon, we know, the son of David, the king, a royal child. But he was at his birth wrapped in swaddling clothes. And here Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes, shows again an allusion. Jesus is a royal type, a king and son of David. And we see in the birth incident, reactions of different people. First group, shepherds, who come and find the angelic sign and verify. They recognize their Lord and they glorify and praise God. Second group is the people who hear this message from shepherds. They hear, they are astonished. That doesn't mean that they believed. Their astonishment is not surely the sign of their faith. And the third group, that is Mary. Mary who kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, interpreting them in her heart. She attempts to discover the hidden meaning behind all these marvelous things happening. So these are the three different groups. You can just think where we, when we hear the message. And the next incident is the naming of Jesus. The circumcision, naming, presentation of Jesus at the temple. We know when the presentation time, uh, Mary and Joseph takes the offering of the poor people. And who came there? Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit and Anna. And they prophesied and spoke about and glorified God. And the last incident in this narrative section is Jesus in the temple. And we know the incident, Jesus travels to Jerusalem with his parents and while returning, he remained in the temple and all that, that story. And what is it? Every Jew was expected to come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Jesus is slowly introduced to the house of his heavenly father. He gives priority to what he is supposed to do. In a way, Jesus slowly disconnects from the earthly parents and gets into the mission of his father or the mission entrusted to him by the father. So this is what we have seen the infancy narrative in different 10 uh, small incident segments. First is Annunciation to Zechariah, then to Mary, Visitation, and the meaning and the significance of magnificent, why Benedictus is important, what is the importance of birth of Jesus, and the importance of manger and its significance, and the rest of the events. From there, the third part of our today's task, that is the themes of the gospel. We can see many themes, enough themes, but very important themes, Universalism, by this time you know what it is. Gospel of the poor, we know why it is called gospel of poor. Gospel of mercy and pardon, Jesus the healer, gospel of the Holy Spirit, discipleship, 
liberation of women, gospel of ju social justice, love for the Samaritans and the Gentiles, gospel of prayer, joy in the Lord. Mm, These themes are already very clear in our mind, but some of them, which are very significant, we shall see in detail. First, universalism. We have already seen why it is a universal gospel. At the beginning, the goodness of great joy for all the people. At the end, repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations, not to Jews, not to Indians, not to Austrians, but to all people. The name Theophilus, the meaning of Theophilus, Theos, God, Philos, lover. So it is not written to the people of Colossia, it is not only written to people of Corinth or not written to Asia, but it is written to all those who love God. And in the Song of Angels and in the Song of Simeon, peace, joy and salvation are offered to all, not for one or two category, for all. In the preaching of John the Baptizer, Luke introduced the phrase, all humankind shall see the salvation of God. If you look at the same in Matthew and Mark, they don't use that all humankind. It's they stop with Isaiah chapter 43 verse, whereas Luke adds 5 2 to introduce the theme of universalism there or to include everyone. Luke goes back to Adam, already I have told you, not with Abraham, but he goes back to Adam. And Luke omits very important to anti-universalistic statements. We very well we know uh, the story of Syrophoenician woman. In Matthew and Mark both we see this example. Jesus uh, tells, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is not fair to take the child's food and throw it to the dogs. See, so critical were strong words. Luke completely avoids this statement in his gospel. The same way when Jesus sent with a mission the disciples, he's, it's in Matthew, it is mentioned, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans. Luke totally delete this particular part from there and he sent people to everyone. So a universal gospel. And liberation of women, already I have mentioned, but still Luke and, G Luke and Jesus gave women due rights and favorable place in the society. Luke portraits widows and neglected ones, sick women, women who, women who anointed Jesus' feet and whose sins he forgave, Martha and Mary, women disciples, and very extraordinarily to parabolic women. The woman searches the lost coin. What is important there? God searching for the sinner is presented here in, the, in a woman. In the parable of a widow who persistently pleaded to a judge to give her justice. And we see in the opposite side a woman, a man who is insistently implored his friend for bread. So two parables look very clearly present women as symbols or examples. And when we come to the next gospel of the poor, Jesus first, right from the beginning, Jesus identifies himself with the poor from birth in the manger till death on the cross. The baby Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, not in a belt or in a safety of a house, but in a manger. Jesus proclaimed then, the latest stage when he started preaching, he proclaimed his manifesto to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor in the synagogue, to good news to the poor. And Jesus acclaimed in his sermon on the plain, the poor are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And Jesus, look and presentation, Jesus extols poverty and teaches a right attitude towards riches, the parable of the rich fool, the sharing, the parable of Lazarus and rich men. Normally nobody wants to read, forget the story. And parable of the pounds, how to use the wealth with the right attitude. 
so jesus has a special identification with the poor and when we considered social justice of course it was a gospel of social justice the parable of the two debtors the need for forgiveness to see how we need to be just and righteous the parable of the rich fool sharing and generosity as opposed to selfishness the parable of the dishonest manager to motivate honest striving in matters pertaining to god and parable of rich men and lazarus as i have told you we can never forget this story like prodigal son story the uncharitable act and the consequent punishment the parable of pounds and saying so i'm giving in many places different occasions we see that and wealth and money are meant to distribute meant to be distributed to the needy and the poor not for accumulate but to be shared and very specific unique character of gospel of luke gospel of mercy and pardon or gospel to the sinners we know the gospel the parables in chapter 15 which are known as the gospel within the gospel the parable of the lost sheep the chapter we have three parables parable of the lost sheep parable of the lost coin parable of the prodigal and his brother all these three parables a search and the joy of finding the lost one is there and the forgiveness of sinners is so beautifully celebrated in all these three parables so his look and presentation of gospel the gospel of mercy and pardon and jesus attitude towards the sinners look portraits very clearly how jesus see the sinners repentant people first group shepherds who were considered sinners were the first in the company of jesus they were priests jewish priests pharisees but who who are the people or who were the people chosen to hear the message first and peter the first one called to be the disciple he himself confessed that he is a sinner or confessed his sinfulness levi a tax collector called to be his disciple he went and dined in the house of sakhihus a tax collector why the tax collector tax collectors were considered as sinners and the woman sinda whom jesus extended the forgiveness as a model he present look present this woman as a model and from the cross he streamed out words of forgiveness for his executions and what is his parting command it was repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be preached in the name of in his name to all people universalism and what is to be preached repentance and forgiveness so gospel of luke is in in fact a gospel of mercy and forgiveness and gospel of prayer luke start the gospel and ends the gospel in the context of prayer begins in jerusalem temple and ends with prayer and various instances of prayer is mentioned baptism presentation transfiguration agony in the garden on the cross everywhere at the context of prayer the events are prayer. important events in the life of jesus are always accompanied by prayer the prayer of jesus are usually filial addressing god as abba abba father shows his trustful closeness unique relationship with his father so the gospel is a gospel of prayer and gospel of the holy spirit this gospel is infused with the presence action and effects of the holy spirit at the beginning john the baptist will be filled with the holy spirit at the end jesus wish that the apostles to be filled with the holy spirit think infancy narrative every person whom we meet there is filled with holy spirit john the baptist mary and the child elizabeth when she meets mary the holy spirit gave the words of prophecy to zechariah simeon and anna all these people are filled with holy spirit and jesus 
is presented as a person filled with the Holy Spirit or through. So Jesus is portrayed not without explaining right from the beginning. The Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus himself on his baptism. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. After temptations, he returned to Galilee filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. At the synagogue, he affirmed that the Spirit of the Lord is come upon me. At the disciples return after ministry, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. To the people who pray with the trust, he said that Father would give the Spirit. Jesus taught that Spirit would assist during the moments of persecution. At the end, Jesus promised to send the Spirit or the power upon the disciples waiting in Jerusalem. And discipleship in Luke. In Luke, the discipleship or following of Jesus should be or is radical. It cannot be a side by side business. It's a radical commitment, a costly commitment. And the call of the apostles, when we read the call narratives in Matthew and other gospels and Luke, what is very important, other gospels we see, they left the father with both. They left the net and boat and followed him. But take Luke precise way. They left everything and followed him. So a total, absolute commitment to Jesus. Not the things or some person, but everything and followed Jesus. And we have four important texts on discipleship. The first one, Luke chapter 9, 23, 27. And this reading has parallel in Mark and Matthew. What is the uniqueness of Luke and narrative? Luke adds the time daily to carry cross. Those, those who want to follow must carry cross everywhere. But daily, carry the cross daily. This is only a specification in Luke. So, radicality in following Jesus is here. Discipleship. Discipleship is the fidelity to day-to-day -day life. It's a daily martyrdom. Not merely in once upon a time, but it is a daily martyrdom. And second is chapter 9, verse 57, 62. Radicality in following of Jesus is express, expressed nowhere, no one. When we read the passage, we see the word nowhere. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head down. And no one. So, Total giving up of both place and persons. And the third reading has a parallel in Matthew where Luke mentions among the list of people whom a disciple must renounce, wife. We know why? A person to whom one must always be attached. So the disciples must give up all his or her positions, including the closest, most personal one. And the fourth text is chapter 18. There Luke mentions negatively, discipleship is not to own anything. No place, no man, no position. But positively, to allow oneself to be guided by Christ and his values. This is very important. We give up everything and we do not possess Jesus or Christ's values, then that following is not meaningful. Therefore, we can summarize. Disciples should, according to Luke, would mean being non attached to things and persons, attaches oneself to God, not possessed by creatures, but allows oneself to be possessed by God. And this is the fourth part of program today. What is the concept of Jesus Christ? Christology of Luke. We know people understand Jesus in many ways. Just we, if we ask each other, we have different uh, expressions. Some understand son as son of God. Some Jesus as a prophet. Some Jesus is a great hero, died and risen. And for all the four evangelists agree that Jesus was both man, uh, divine and human. 
divine and human. He was called out of his great love for humankind. He became like us in everything except sin. But what is the difference? Each of the evangelists look, looked at Jesus and understood Jesus from their own perspective and experience. As we, they understood Jesus from their own experience. Matthew, a Jew, wrote to converted Jews, pictured Jesus as a royal messiah, son of David, according to prophetic prophecies. Royal messiah, son of David. For Mark, Jesus was or Jesus is a human and the suffering son of man, destined for glory, one who achieves glory through suffering. And for Luke, who wrote to the Gentile converts, Jesus is the Lord and Savior who came to seek out and save the lost. It's the most important thing. Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord. The term savior used only once as it is in 2.11. And the good, that is to the good news to the age shepherds, angels, good news to the shepherd. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. It, this one statement contained all that Luke wants to say about Jesus. Why or how? The term savior is used for both man and God. God saves everyone and kings and other men, powerful people, they save others. So this savior term is used for different people. When we think about judges, some of the judges consider. But, and we know Jesus is both God and man. So the term savior in that sense, one who saves as God and man, the savior, the term savior is apt for Jesus. Then coming to the Greeks, Gentiles, they call their kings as gods and lord. Lord, this is normal. We know in our country also the uh, kings were considered lord. The Jews waiting for the Messiah. What this Luke did, he combined all these things in one statement and calls Jesus a savior, the Messiah, the Lord. This is the Christology of Luke, savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. Lord or Kyrios is a title which is applied to God as king over all the earth. And we know Jesus becomes the Lord after his resurrection. And Luke uses the term Lord, Kyrios, with an article, Ho Kyrios, the Bible, we say, the same way, the Lord. That means in the absolute sense, there is no other Lord. There is only one Lord, that is Jesus. And the second title, the Messiah. Messiah meaning is it's anointed. So Jesus was anointed by God for the service of the people, which he carried out through his suffering. So Jesus is the Messiah through suffering who brought forward redemption or salvation. And under the term that was prophet expresses Jesus' person and ministry. We do the function. We know the function of prophets. In the Old Testament, they they denounce the oppressive structures in the society, religion, etc. The same Jesus did it, and these Old Testament prophets announced the values of love, peace, justice, etc. The same was the target of mission of Jesus. So Jesus is the Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. So when we think about the Christology of Luke, Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, and the Lord. So we come to finally the theological and inspirational messages of the book. So far what we have discussed from that we understood what is the message of this particular gospel. Salvation that is brought about by Jesus is inclusive of every nation and race. This each statement has value in present day context also. That is the inspiration of message that we must carry. So the message of salvation is for all. Disciples has to, a disciple or the disciple has to renounce everything to follow him. The meaning of everything is very precise, specific and concrete. 
you need to understand what is this everything everything person place position and everything and there is no marginalized in his kingdom no poor and rich no men and women no greek and gentile no samaritans and jews there is no marginalized and dignity of women is taken care the ones failing to render justice is unworthy of his kingdom or those who are not doing justice are unworthy of his kingdom and god is full of mercy and compassion prodigal in his love so what we are supposed to be is the message he pardons every sinner who repents and luke's gospel is the gospel of prayer right from the beginning till the end throughout in the context of prayer and god's will is accomplished through the spirit anointed ministry of jesus and the call and mission is the same mission and mission formula is same for every christian or everyone who is called to continue the mission so to conclude luke brings us close to the jesus of history to us who is the savior and lord of church faith so it is the task of luke in his presentation he brings us close to the jesus of history not only the historical jesus but who is the savior and lord from the point of view of literary merit luke's language presentation and style are clearly superior to other writers or authors and the gospel of luke has contributed much to our liturgy we know in the liturgy we sing the gloria comes from infancy narrative and we have the crib in uh, christmas celebrations it comes from the luke and narrative the liturgy of hours when we think about the liturgy of hours the hymns magnificat dimittis are uh, everything comes from infancy narrative or from the gospel of infancy narrative of the gospel of luke and the gospel close to a human a gospel when we think gospel luke gospel luke is the gospel close to a human nature and life with the sentence that i have started the gospel which is close to a human nature and life and luke not stops there luke presents a follow up of the story of jesus in the form of early history of the moment that is the acts of the apostle so we have a gospel in the life of jesus historical jesus continues through the mission of apostle that means the continuation of the mission and i know there are some paragraph questions to be discussed this the things what we have seen the points but just for a, a, a clear only focusing on the questions and answers theology of magnificat as we have seen mary's thanksgiving hymn is traditionally called the magnificat means exalts or glorifies which is the first word of the latin translation of the text it resembles hannah's prayer of thanksgiving in the old testament also refers back to many other old testament hymns the magnificat is both conservative and revolutionary both personal and social in perspective how it is conservative because it affirms the fulfillment of god's promises to israel but it is revolutionary because it proclaims the over 10 reversal of society god had reversed their conditions morally politically and socially it is personal because it is it initially focuses on mary but it suggests that what god has for the entire humanity there comes the social aspect and the key concepts of lowly and mighty are developed and the third group is introduced the humans who are proud and powerful and rich 
He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. They are rulers and people of power, and the rich people who are negligent of the needy people. Here comes the moral revolution. God's power appears in bringing down human powers and lifting up the lowly and hungry. Both social status and economic status are are overturned. The Magnificat not only focused on God's gracious, glorious mercy and deliverance, but has been interpreted to speak of three revolutions as we have seen. So Mary's song of divine victory over the powerful becomes. A song of warning, instructions, and hope. The canticle reminds us that God is constantly faithful to His covenantal promises to His people. And as we know, this song, Magnificat, is the foundational text for libera liberation theology, even in present-day context. And second, Gospel of the Holy Spirit, we have beautifully seen that. Almost every page of the Gospel is permeated with the person's presence, actions, and effects of the Holy Spirit. At the beginning, at the end, throughout the infancy narrative, and we have already seen, you can see, infancy narrative. And then Jesus, how right from the beginning, throughout his ministry and suffering, death and resurrection everywhere how the presence of holy spirit is filled in his life so at the end when jesus promised to send the spirit upon the disciples waiting in jerusalem so it is the gospel of holy spirit because every action done here every word spoke every person who spoke is filled with the holy spirit or everything that came out of the work of Holy Spirit. And the most important fact, aspect of the Gospel of Luke, what we must understand, Christology of Luke. As I have mentioned in during explanation, explaining, people understand Jesus in different ways, son of God, prophet, hero, whatever may be. For the evangelist too had primary importance, questions, evangelist too, the question, has the primary importance. All of them agree that Jesus is son of God or God, and at the same time, son of man or human being. He was God. Out of his great love for humankind, he became like us in everything except sin. But they would like to understand or explain Jesus from their own experience. So for Matthew, it's a royal messiah. Mark, a human suffering, son of man, destined for hope, glory, and look, Jesus is the Lord and Savior. I, I think, or I hope you know how he is Savior, how he is sa Lord. Savior, because he came in search of the lost and the sin. And he's the Lord, because he is the Lord of all creation. He's the Messiah, he's the anointed one, because anointed for the service of God, anointed by God. So he is the Savior, Lord, and Messiah. And the gospel is the gospel of pardon and mercy, or the gospel to the sinners. Gospel of Luke presents Jesus as a compassionate Savior who came in search of the lost. Jesus' attitude towards sinners is finely portrayed in every pages by Luke. The shepherds who were considered sinners were the first ones who received the message. Peter, who was the first one called to be the disciple, confessed his sinfulness. He called Levi. He went to the house of Sakhebus, a tax collector. He forgave the woman sinner because he did not discriminate everyone. Everyone who, every sinner who repented or with repentance came to him, he accepted. And from the cross also, he prayed for those who crucified him. And his parting command, commandment was also that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be pre proclaimed or preached. And we have uh, the super parables in chapter 15. They are the gospel within the gospel. And when the shepherd goes after the one, 
the shepherd goes after the one that is lost until he finds it the woman lights up the lamp sweeps the house and searches carefully the prodigal father is searching and waiting for the son in all the three there is there is joy of finding the lost one the forgiveness of sinners and the joy of finding the lost is beautifully explained and it is presented clearly jesus love for the sinners is so extraordinary that we can look gospel the gospel of mercy and pardon and i think the disciples aspect we have seen very clearly it's a radical commitment and one must leave everything and follow him and everything means place person and positions and negatively it is re renouncing everything positively it is at the same time to be possessed by god himself so this following of jesus is a radical commitment gospel of prayer that is the last question to be discussed there i think and we have seen the gospel begins at the context of prayer ends at the context of prayer and all the events of jesus life is presented in the gospel as accompanied by prayer and we have events of course i have already told baptism transfiguration agony in the garden every event is accompanied by prayer and we have instances of the prayer common with the synoptics and there are nine unique instances of prayer in gospel of luke and it, and there are three parables on prayer found only in luke the parables on prayer we don't find in other gospels the prayers of jesus are as we have seen filial addressing god as abba father showing his unique relationship with father and this shows the trustful relationship trustful closeness to god the abba father therefore as we have seen or i don't exactly remember whether i have mentioned look omit the citation from psalm 22 1 we see in matthew and mark is the cross cry my god my god why have you forgot forsaken me or have you forsaken me and we don't we don't see this prayer in or the citation of psalm 22 1 in gospel of luke the reason jesus god luke and jesus has a trustful filial relation with god the father his abba so there is no desperation seemingly this prayer as a prayer of desperation luke purpose intentionally omits that prayer we understand in that way i think it is good the last sister. good sister simi danya korean for presenting your points very well and uh, i appreciate your scientific presentation and our students are also appreciating through their comments and you have prepared the lesson very well so the lesson we were following in our college you got taken and you have added your own personal insights especially the towards the section towards the theological presentation of christ the christology and on discipleship so they were very personal and congratulations to you sister for your clarity of thought and your clarity in presentation good thank you so now uh, we have some comments very positive wonderful presentation rejoice jalandhar so they have put then preena has said so glad to have a woman of god speaking to us on luke's gospel thank you sister simi for your very systematic presentation i appreciate the clarity examples and comparison of gospels as well then she has asked a question we'll discuss it then sister rosi thank you so much sister so well you have presented sister i would like to have your slides so we'll give them the slides and mrs anjana biswas has put thank you sister kurian very clear explanation interesting and then sister elizabeth and she congratulates you then patricia the name says she has raised a question we'll discuss then aloysius i uh, thank sister simi for the simple and wonderful presentation then helen francis lucil 
then Anishma, Joseph Balthasar, Yuan, so all appreciate you. Okay, good. And Sister Manisha, Sister Lily, Anita Kopal, so the list goes on. So good. Very good. Two questions have come up, Sister Demi, uh, Semi Danya. So number one is uh, from Rina, that is, everyone is called to be a missionary. And she's telling, I think everyone is a missionary in their own vocation, single or married, ordained or consecrated. Can you please explain how the points in this slide are related to the missionary role in various vocations, calling, especially married and single? So maybe any, mm -hmm. how who could, one could be a missionary in a married life or in a single life? Okay. Yes. Uh, as I understand, my explanation is here. How can be a married person be a missionary? Of course, a poem come. Uh, renounce your wife. That's the context it is written. But when you are a married person, it is not that to renounce your wife or husband. At the same time, an example I am taking, this is something to radical disciples. You, one must uh, give up or renounce wife or husband, whatever. But the point comes here, one example I'm telling. It is not that you renounce because you are, marriage is also a, a sacrament. You have promised before God. Now it is not the way you, but at the same time, being with husband, leading a faithful married, who must be there with you, with Jesus. And the values of Jesus, forgiveness, compassion, uh, respecting one another, all these things comes into your missionary life as a married woman or a man. That begins first at home, with your life partner, then with your children, with your own family surroundings, then from there you can extend your mission uh, of being compassionate, being, it's not an, about possessions, okay, you are a you cannot give up everything and in utter poverty every day go but at the same time the way you have positive or compassionate with those who are in need those who are needy your attitude to share with others so missionary call involves all these aspects not only that only literal meaning of give up everything Good. it's an example so we can explain i think everything every point in that context Good, good sister Simi. And the second question is the names in Matthew and Luke's birth narrative. I think by that they mean genealogy. Do not match. Different scholars have different views. What's your view? So the question is put. You would like to answer? The names in genealogy. Yeah, like for example, the grandfather of uh, Jesus, uh, okay, is Jacob in Matthew and Haley in Luke. So that's uh, usually people raise that question but the answer maybe i would help you it's very simple like uh, both of them take from different sources so that is the actual answer and we don't uh, just because it's contradictory we don't think that uh, it was it's not real and also joseph's father might have had two names one could be jacob another could be ali so luke found that name ali and he took into that genealogy Okay, thank Sister Simi, if you'd like to add, you could. Yeah. I think your answers are perfect. I, I no. don't need to add anything to that. <laughs> Good, Sister Simi. So, Sister, any other doubt? One last question, with that we'll wind up. Okay, then. Good, Sister Simi, could you, could you please say a prayer? Then we will continue. Yes. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 52, uh, verse 49. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. We thank and praise you, Lord, for this beautiful hour of being with you hearing your words and understanding you and we believe that your promise to stay here in the city allow us lord where we are with your words and the message 
and being filled with the Holy Spirit as we read, understand, meditate, and trying to put into practice your words, your message. Give us the full fullness of your Holy Spirit that your power may descend upon us, that we may be filled and empowered by your Spirit to live your message every day, every moment of our life, wherever we are and whatever we are doing. And Jesus bless each one of us and everyone who arranges this program for the benefit of others. Bless each one of them. Bless, bless each one of us. And we ask you, Lord, to bless all those who are at this very moment in struggles, difficulties, struggling with life due to different reasons. Bless each one of them and be compassionate to them, Lord, and have compassion and mercy upon each one of us that we may be the missionaries of true missionaries of your gospel everywhere we are. For this grace, we pray to you and we thank you and we surrender all our prayers in the holy name of Jesus our Lord. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Simidanya, yes. for your very good prayer. So, my dear brothers and sisters, on behalf of the chairman and all of you, I take this moment to thank Sister Simidanya Kurian for her readiness to take this class for us and for her systematic presentation and very clarity in content and presentation. And thank you, sister. And on behalf of our college, we wish you all the best for your doctoral research, which you are going on, going to end shortly. So the best wishes to you. And you